Hello, I hope that you hear me well. My name is Samira Elshadovna Lawrence, and this is the first lecture on pharmacology, introduction to the subject. Uh, today we are going to discuss some aspects of educational process, some rules on our department, and what we are going to study during the year. Okay, firstly, uh, I want to tell you that uh, we have two disciplines. Uh, the first discipline is pharmacology itself and the second is phytopharmacology. But phytopharmacology only students of general medicine study. And this is actually almost the same, but it touches more um, substances related to the herbs. Uh, that doesn't mean that students of dentistry and pharmacy will not ever touch phytopharmacology. Actually, we will discuss some herbal drugs with all the students. Uh, you study pharmacology if you study on general medicine or dentistry for two semesters. If you study on pharmacy, you will have pharmacology for three semesters, the third year and the half of fourth year. So we will be together for the longer time. Uh, on our department, we have our special rating system. I don't think that you have ever met such system before. So let's look at that, how it will happen. Uh, marks are assigned in accordance with the results of classroom, midterm, and end of course assessments. Uh, every class you have points. Maximum is 26. From where we take the 6 and from where we take 20, I will tell you a little bit later, okay? Then we also have colloquiums. You already know what is it, colloquium. And uh, we have five of them during the year. And each colloquium gives you 100 points. Then what we do? We sum up all these gain points throughout the year or one and a half year for pharmacy. And then we find your percent from the maximum possible points. So here I give you the example. You can see, yes. For example, your score and for in first class you got 20 points, then 17 points, then 15 and on colloquium you got 85. So I just sum it up and I have the total 137 points. And the maximum possible, which you can gain if you are absolutely genius, absolutely genius students. And you know, sometimes I know some students could do that and maybe you will do that. 26 and 26 and 26 and 100. So this is maximum possible, which can give you maximum 178. So then I will find out your rating out of this. 178 as a maximum gives me 100%. And your score gives me X percent. I don't know how much is it. So using this proportion, I can find your percent. 137 multiplied with 100 divided by maximum possible, and I have 77%. So this will be your annual mark in the end of the year. This will be your annual rating. So that is how we get it. Uh, if you want to complete the course successfully, it is necessary to attend all the lectures and practical classes. It is absolutely obligatory. If you miss them, you have some problems. Uh, you will have less marks in rating, so you will have less score in the end of the year. And uh, of course, to finish our pharmacology course, you have to um, complete it successfully with the current and final mark higher than 55%. I think you know why 55%, because 55 is satisfactory in our university and everything that is less is poor, which is considered to fail. Okay, next. 
the structure of practical class. I already told you that every practical class you can gain 26 points. Now let's look at um, the sources of your points. During the class, you have incoming control. This is prescribing recipes. You know recipes, yes? Uh, when the doctor wants to administrate the drug, he prescribes a recipe. So we will study how to do that. Uh, we will practice a lot. We will have um, three classes dedicated um, to recipes. So uh, after that, when you learn how to do that, during the whole year, you will make these prescriptions according to the topic. Doesn't matter any type of drugs, drugs affecting uh, GIT, drugs affecting CNS. Uh, for every group of drugs, you will make prescriptions, you will make recipes. So these recipes can give you maximum six points. If I give you three, drugs every drug gives you two points if you make absolutely correct recipe if there is a mistake i will give you one point out of two yes if there are more mistakes or the recipe is absolutely wrong it gives you zero so three prescriptions two points each in total gives you maximum six and then I check your homework, I ask you some theoretical questions, or maybe I give you a mm, situational task on which you give me the answer. And for this answer, which confirms your preparation, I can give you maximum 20 points, from zero to 20. And uh, finally, you can gain 26 this is maximum possible during the practical class. What about colloquiums? Um, when we were on our offline education, uh, not on this distance, we had computer testings. And uh, actually, I think that maybe during the distance education, we will also have computer testings. Uh, what is it? It includes 50 multiple choice questions. Uh, about the topic of the colloquium. Tasks are selected by the computer program randomly, and uh, you have the time limit, 30 minutes for 50 MCQ tasks. So maximum that you can get for these 50 questions is 100 points. So you understand that every question gives you two points. Uh, there are many answers in each question. I mean, many correct answers, not just one correct, many of them. But there is not, nothing actually special to prepare for that, so don't worry. And in the end of the year, or in the end of one and a half year, you will have the final exam. Final exam consists of three parts, as usual, I think. You are familiar to this system because first step is always again MCQ on computers. Uh, it will be 100 tasks. Second part, this is a, practi a practical skill. Your practical skill is to make prescriptions, to make recipes. And third part is your oral answer. Actually, it can be a situational task, some may be theoretical questions from the professor. And finally, uh, these three parts of exam give you the final mark. Uh, fi I mean, exam, examination mark. Final mark consists of your annual rating plus your examination mark. So what you have here. If you have uh, more than 85, this is excellent. If you have from 70 to 84, this is good, and uh, more than 55 is satisfactory, and less than 55 is poor. Four, that means that you failed. The final rating, uh, as I already told you that it is determined by the sum of annual and examination ratings. Annual rating, I already told you how we do that. We sum up and then we find percent. And uh, 
if you have annual rating more than 85%, uh, you can get the Exxon mark not automatically, but with the simple scheme of final exam. But as we don't know how the final exam will be in the end of this year, maybe maybe it will be in distance, but I hope not. So um, if it is offline, when you have more than 85, you only pass the first step of final exam, MCQ. And for the rest two, you have uh, 100 points automatically. So we don't have that aftermath. We don't have it, but it is a simple exam for those who gain more than uh, 85. Okay. Um, if you have less than 55, then you pass all three stages, MCQ, then practical skill, and then theoretical um, oral answer. Mm -hmm. And now a little bit about pharmacology. It's just a brief uh, description of the subject. Actually, we will study that in our next classes and we will talk about that more in uh, lecture on general pharmacology and so on. So briefly, pharmacology uh, is the science that studies drugs and their actions on the living organism. And pharmacology is mainly divided into two big parts. They are pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. What are these parts of pharmacology? Pharmacodynamics studies the drug action itself, the drug action on the body. And pharmacokinetics studies the process of drug movement in the body. How to remember that? I'm showing you. Pharmacodynamics, you see letter D, is how drug affects the body. And pharmacokinetics, how body affects the drug. Uh, I can tell you the examples of that. For example, uh, pharmacodynamics, how drug affects the body. Yes, we can say that um, acetylsalicylic acid can um, reduce the inflammation. This is effect, an effect of the drug. So I can say that the drug, acetylsalicylic acid, affects the body by reducing the inflammation. Okay? So this is pharmacodynamics of this uh, drug. Also, I can say that it affects on some kind of receptors, some kind of ion channels, some kind of molecules in the body. It can change the structure of enzyme or something like that. All these effects, they uh, go to pharmacodynamics. And pharmacokinetics is a little bit different. It's the process of movement of the drug and how body affects the drug. For example, um, how um, does the body slowly absorb the drug or it's the fast absorption, how it eliminates from the body. Again, it can be slowly or it can be fast or maybe it can be eliminated with the urine from kidneys, yes, or it can be eliminated uh, with exhaled air through your lungs. So different ways how the body can move. I can absorb it, I can metabolize it somehow. Maybe some biochemical transformation can happen with the drug and then I eliminate that. So all this process, what my body does to the drug, it goes to pharmacokinetics. I hope that this is clear, but we will also discuss that in the topic of general pharmacology. So don't worry if you didn't understand it now. Some terms uh, which will be useful for you in your first uh, classes on pharmacology. Medical substances in Russian, лекарственные средства are the substances used for prevention, diagnosis, treatment of the disease, pregnancy prevention, and so on, derived from blood, blood plasma, as well as organs, human or animal tissues, plants, minerals, and so on. What is important here? 
In this case, a medical substance can contain various different agents. That doesn't mean that only one molecule is in the medical substance. Yes, it can be uh, like a complex, complex of different molecules which can have some effects. Okay, complex. Dosage form. Dosage form, guys, this is very important. Please, now this lecture, in this lecture, you should try to understand what is a dosage form because you will need it in your first class. So, dosage form, lekarstvena forma. It's an easy to use condition of the medical product or medical plant material that helps to achieve the necessary therapeutic effect. It's a form, it's a condition of the drug. For example, I will tell you example. Example is uh, mm, tablet, for example, tablet, yes, tablet or solution or something like that. I will even write this example here for you. For example, tablet, tablet solution, maybe, mm, you know, gel, yes? So this is just a form. It's not the um, specific drug. It's just a form in which the drug can be. This is understandable, I guess. Uh, so this is dosage form. Okay. I hope you will remember that. Next, um, next term is the pharmacological substance. Pharmacological средство. It's the substance or mixture of substances which established pharmacological activity and which is now studied in clinical trials. So um, here we know that, okay, we have some substance, some medical substance, but it is not yet a drug because uh, there is not enough information for us to safely use it on people. We just now are on the stage of preclinical trials or clinical trials. I hope that you know what is it, clinical trials. It's when we try the drug on uh, preclinical on animals and then clinical on people. Okay. But we don't know if it is quite safe or it is quite effective. Maybe uh, after this stage, we will understand that this drug is not very good and we will not use it. So, it, so the pharmacological substance is not good and it will not become the drug. So it will only stay the pharmacological subject or sub substance, sorry. Well, next, medical agent, lekarstvene vishestvo. This is a pharmacological substance, individual chemical compound or biologically active substance that can be used to prevent, diagnose or treat diseases. For example, acetyl salicylic acid. So you see the difference here. Medical agent is the one agent. It's one molecule, yes. Acetyl salicylic acid, it's one molecule. It's biological active molecule. It's a chemical compound which can be used for some treatment and so on, okay? It's not that first substance because it is individual. Okay, and now drug or medicine, lekarstvene preparat. This is a dosed medical substance in a certain form. Let's try to understand what is the difference. Look here, acetylsalicylic acid. Actually, it can be in various dosage form. It can be uh, acetylsalicylic acid syrup, acetylsalicylic acid solution, acetylsalicylic acid tablet, and so on. But if you have a certain dosage form, with a certain drug, for example, tablet of acetyl salicylic acid, um, acid with a dose, with dose 0 0.5 grams. Yes, so here you can see it is not just something, it's not just acetyl salicylic acid, it's already a tablet with this drug with the dose 0 0.5. Now we understand everything about this and we can say that, okay, this is a real drug. This is a real medicine. Okay. Okay. So let's go next. Our brand 
or original medicine a drug, it's a new drug that first appeared on the pharmaceutical market. For example, the Bauer company, Bayer company uh, in Germany, they actually discovered this acetyl salicylic acid and called it aspirin. Mm -hmm. uh, aspirin. So aspirin was, aspirin by Bayer was the original medicine because they discovered. And then reproduced medicine is a drug containing the same agent in the same dose and dosage form and having the same effect. So after Bayer, various different uh, firms in the world also tried to make their own uh, acetylsalicylic acid, which was absolutely copy of aspirin of Bayer company, okay? What, what is next? Bioequivalence. Bioequivalence is the term connected to um, some reproduced drugs. It's when two substances containing the same active agent in the same dose and dosage form have the same bioavailability. Uh, what does it mean? It means that, for example, I take uh, the tablet of acetylsalicylic acid, uh, 0 0.5, but only um, 0 0.25 reach, reaches my bloodstream. Да? Смотрите, I take, take 0 0.5 of acetyl salicylic acid, but only um, a half of it reaches my bloodstream. Yes, so this means that only a half of it got to my blood. If the half, that means bioavailability will be 50%. Bioavailability, 50%. Okay, so if one drug has bioavailability of acetylsalicylic acid with the dose 0.5, 50%, and another drug, has also acetylsalicylic acid with this dose and with the same bioavailability, in this case, we can say, okay, these two drugs are bioequivalent. They have bioequivalence. But if two drugs have the same, for example, dose, one drug has 0 0.5 and second 0 0.5, but one of them has 50% bioavailability and another has 40% bioavailability. They are not bioequivalent, okay? So if they have only the same characteristics. And then therapeutic equivalence. It's the equivalence in effectiveness and toxicity of drugs containing the same active substance when administrated to the same subjects why this is again important. For example, I can have um, the drugs are absolutely the same according to acetylsalicylic acid, 0 0.5 here, and uh, another drug with the same 0 0.5 here, but they have different, um, for example, different um, starch in one, and tells them in second. So they have different um, additional substances. Different additional substances, for example, is just, is just my uh, example. And uh, according to these different additional substances, they can have a little bit different effect, a little bit, just a small difference, but they are already not therapeutic equivalent. Uh, so you can see that everything should be absolutely the same for two drugs if we want to call them therapeutically equivalent. Mm -hmm. I hope this is understandable. Okay, and what we have also, we have 
that thing like placebo effect. Placebo, from Latin pleasure, is the pharmacologically inactive substance administrated to patients under the, uh, I don't know how you read that, <laughs> under the views or gears or views, I think, of a medicinal product. So that means I give you just something, for example, I don't know, sugar, tablet made of sugar, but I tell you, oh, this is a very effective medicine, the new medicine, it will absolutely treat you. And what happens that moment? The patient starts to believe that. And in case of pain, there is up to, not four, it's 40, mm, 40, 40, of course, from 40 to 80% uh, effectiveness, from 40 to 80% effectiveness. If the patient has bronchospasm, bronch uh, like in bronchial uh, asthma, from 20 to 30% effectiveness. In case of insomnia, 30 to 65%. And in angina pectoris, it's uh, pain in chest, you know, uh, the heart, heart pain, uh, from 15 to 35%. What does it mean, guys? That means that if patient only believes that his pain should be reduced, the pain is really reduced. And not only pain. Okay, it's clear with insomnia. Talking about insomnia, I understand that patient believes that he wants to sleep and he really falls asleep. He stops uh, his anxiety maybe or he stops his, uh, his thoughts about his future or past and finally he falls asleep. But very interesting effect on bronchoconstriction, for example, yes. So really the patient feels more uh, calm and uh, more comfortable and he, he feels that, okay, it is easier to breathe, really. So the placebo effect can even help in that case. And this is very interesting. Okay, we can also classify medicines in different ways. For example, alphabetically, it's not very um, comfortable actually. It's only for posting in drug formularies and different uh, dictionaries, you know, like that, different lists of drugs and so on. Uh, chemical classification. Uh, drugs can be derivatives of different chemical structures. Uh, for example, benzocaine has that benzo ring in, in it, and some other drugs containing benzo ring can be also uh, brought to this group. But our interesting classification will be pharmacological classification. For example, by systems, uh, cardiovascular drugs affecting on cardiovascular system, drugs affecting on CNS, and so on. Also by classes, antiarrhythmic, antihypertensive, and so on. So you see, yeah, cardiovascular drugs, they can be antiarrhythmic and they can be antihypertensive, but of course effects are absolutely different, but they all go to cardiovascular. Then by groups, by groups, uh, by mechanism, I would say. Blockers of sodium channels, for example, beta blockers, uh, maybe activators of potassium channels and so on. So it means on which target in the cell do this drug effect, this drug's effect. Um, also, we have pharmacotherapeutic classification. This is interesting. For example, for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. For the treatment of peptic ulcer disease, we can have absolutely different drugs. For example, we can use antibio antibiotics. Uh, why antibiotics? Because there is a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, which can cause the peptic ulcer disease. But not only that, also we can use the blockers of um, H potassium ATPase to reduce the uh, HCL in the stomach, the acidity in the stomach. Also we can use some antacids also to reduce acidity and so on. 
guys, even, even we can use some drugs affecting on CNS in that case, because stress is actually a big problem in peptic ulcer disease. So you can see that in this pharmacotherapeutic classification, treatment of one disease can uh, include absolutely different various types of the drugs. Uh, so on, in bronchial asthma, the same, of course, different. And also how we name the drugs. We have various, um, how to say it, various ways of naming of the drugs. For example, chemical name. It describes the chemical structure of the drug. This you studied in um, organic chemistry. And uh, for example, pharmacy students, I'm sure that you know these uh, names very, very well. Uh, I'm not sure about general medicine and dentistry, but pharmacy, they study these chemical names during the whole period of education. So for example, for example, yes, 242-methylpropylphenylpropionic uh, <laughs> acid, R is missing here actually. And, um, and uh, nothing we can say about this drug because we just don't remember what is it and how it affects. So this chemical is only for chemists. It's not for us as, a doc as doctors. Uh, so next, international non generic name, okay? Uh, generic name, it's the official name of the drug. It is not owned by any company. It is universally accepted, actually all over the world. Everybody in the world knows this drug name. And if you are in Russia or you are in India or you are in Egypt, in Iraq, doesn't matter. Anywhere, every doctor will know that name. For example, ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, everybody heard it because it's a worldwide spread drug name, ibuprofen. The same we can say about uh, acetylsalicylic acid and so on. Okay, next. The brand name, trend name, trade name is the registered trademark of the drug company. Often it is easier to pronounce not always, but we know that by a company which produces the drug. For example, Nurofen. Nurofen, I guess you also heard it, but actually Nurofen is ibuprofen. It is not another drug. It is just the trade name of this drug, which is registered by one company which produces this kind of ibuprofen. And what else we have here? Uh, two principles of the drug usage. Cantaria, cantarius. <laughs> this is treating the opposite. It's the allopath principle. Allopathy is actually what we study in pharmacology. We study pharmacology because, um, okay, for example, if you know that you have inflammation, you use anti inflammatory drugs. This is opposite. It's the treatment when you stop the process which you don't want to spread in the body. So this is our principle which we study here and which we use in our practice. But also there is a principle of similis similibus, the homeopathy. Homeopath principle is the treatment of the same by the same. For example, for example, uh, homeopathy um, says that if you have um, what? If you have a cold, you should use the antibodies to your immune uh, system, like interferons. Antibodies to interferons. So you like you fight with your uh, immune system on that moment when you should use it for fighting of the cold or flu. In this homeopathy principle, they are using 
very, very, very small dose. I can say negligible dose, doses. And um, we don't study it in the course of pharmacology. Um, I think even that we don't study homeopathy in our university at all, because this is considered to be not a science, but pseudoscience and not all the scientific community confirms that homeopathy can work. So unfortunately, in our university, we don't study that. Uh, but if you are interested in that, you can study that yourself, of course. Uh, and here in the, uh, <laughs> in the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see the enormous numbers which companies make on uh, producing uh, allopathic, allopathic medicine and <laughs> much less that companies do on producing the homeopathic medicines. Maybe this is the, uh, <laughs> the problem why we don't study the homeopathy. Of course, it's a joke. Uh, okay. Uh, so what are the international standards for the development of medicines? This is good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice, good clinical practice and investigation of new drug. Actually, these are some principles which are studied in the um, course of pharmacy uh, because they give you the rules how the drug should be produced. You will study them not in pharmacology here, I'm just telling you that uh, drugs, uh, they are not produced as you wish. We have the world spread principles which should be maintained in the factories where the drugs are made. And the evidence-based medicine also tells us how we should study the drug before releasing that in the market. And uh, we have different levels of evidentiary. The best, the best level is 1A level. It's when the drug has a well-designed, large, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. That means that the drug is absolutely safe, absolutely effective, and you can use it for every patient with no doubts. And that means the drug is, the drug will be like a first line drug recommended for the treatment of this disease. Uh, then all these uh, classes below, they have not that good uh, clinical trials or maybe you see second is small randomized controlled trials, case control studies or cohort studies, and some information in the reports of expert groups or consensus, consensus of specialists. So if one doctor observes the effect of one drug, that doesn't mean that this drug is really effective. If you can see this effect, that doesn't mean that it really has it, you know? <laughs> because to confirm the efficacy of the drug, we should try it on many, many people, on thousands, I can say, of people, okay, not thousands, but hundreds of people, hundreds of people with different, um, how to say it, like different uh, stages of control. And only when we check it so many times, we can say, yes, this drug is quite effective. We will use it in our patients. So that is why we have this evidence-based medicine and we always try to follow it and we always try to administrate the drugs with the maximum possible, possibly high level of evidentiary. Okay, actually this is the end of uh, my presentation. I want to tell you thank you for your attention and with your teachers, you will also uh, discuss this topic, what is it, pharmacology and all this, and how to make recipes. So see you on the next lecture on our course. Goodbye.